I'm now going to be talking about the collapse of the LiDAR signal chain. And when I say collapse, I am not necessarily predicting doom for LiDAR. I actually mean collapse as in the integration of functions into fewer and fewer components throughout the LiDAR signal chain. As from the introduction, the company I work for is called Analog Devices. We're a component supplier, and we view ourselves as the bridge, if you will, between the physical world and the digital world. And what does that really mean? Well, we make a bunch of electronic components which perform functions such as sensing, digitization of those uh, sensing, as well as, of course, signal conditioning, and then connecting that information to the digital world, whether that be the cloud or some other storage medium. And we also support uh, power management functions to uh, sort of underlie all of these other uh, more uh, signal-oriented or signal-conditioning-oriented functions. And I think from this point of view, we can offer a bit of a unique perspective to a conference like this because we don't have a particular dog in the race when it comes to which LiDAR architecture do we think will or sh even should succeed. Our goal is to really support all of them uh, and understand them, of course, to make sure we're offering the right support but uh, <clears throat> through our components, be able to work with all of the different LiDAR manufacturers. Uh, just a little bit more detail on the group that I'm part of. There's a business unit that we have called Autonomous Transportation and Safety. LiDAR is part of it, but it's not the only sensing technology. We also have groups working on radar and inertial MEMS. <clears throat> Uh, just a quick background on those, just to give you a little bit of context for where we come from. In Inertial MEMS, we have a long history. Uh, a little over 25 years ago, we re uh, released the first monolithic MEMS device for airbag deployment. So that means we have a long history of developing products for safety critical applications, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. In terms of automotive radar, we also have more than a decade of experience with products both at 24 gigahertz and 77 gigahertz. And today, for automotive modules that are released and developed in cars, more than half of them have ADI content. Uh, lastly, for LiDAR, though it's not as commercially available uh, and deployed <clears throat> in cars as, say, radar would be, uh, for every LiDAR system, at least that I'm aware of, we have some form of content, whether that be data conversion, amplification, or power management. Okay, so to talk a little bit more about LiDAR now, I actually find it interesting to, to look back towards history a little bit and see what that might teach us. Um, historically, LiDAR, as with just about every technology, has been used for smaller volume applications, higher costs associated with that. We can think of, uh, you know, it was originally developed for military applications, just as with radar. Atmospheric monitoring, wind LiDAR is common, topographic mapping, et cetera. But moving forward, uh, we see integration, reduction in size, reduction in cost, again, as with just about any other technology, leads to the deployment into a broader set of applications, of course, uh, with lower prices. Uh, automotive, that's the reason most of us are here, but also robotics, logistics, smart factories, uh, et cetera, are all utilizing LiDAR. This follows a very similar deployment to radar, where you may have started with large phase arrays here, again, perhaps uh, initiated by the military, but <clears throat> Today, we're sitting with small, integrated, low-cost automotive radar modules that are widely deployed. If you go out and buy a new car today, there's a very high chance that it has one of these modules, or actually multiple uh, of them in it. And I think the interesting question is, will we uh, truly see the same thing for LiDAR? We're all here to talk about this, but are we going to get to these small sensors that cost $100 and are in every new car that's bought? Uh, I don't really have the answer, uh, but I do want to talk about some of the trends that I think will help lead us that direction. Uh, there's not really part of this talk. I think it also brings up an interesting topic of uh, pulsed uh, and eventually moving on to pulse compression, frequency modulated continuous wave. That happened in LiDAR, or sorry, in radar uh, some years ago. We're starting to this, see the same thing in radar. Can we look at, excuse me, LiDAR? Can we look at radar and sort of extract, extract or extrapolate from uh, the progress and the path it took to predict what LiDAR will do? I, again, don't have an answer there, but it's sort of an interesting thought experiment. Okay, uh, to focus a little bit more now on the signal chain, this is my view of it. It's a little biased by being an electronic supplier. I've probably minimized some of the photonics or optics components here. But we have the transmit sig signal chain uh, up top <clears throat> with a laser, a lot of electronics to drive it, uh, perhaps something to steer it, and then the receive signal chain down at the bottom uh, where we have a photo detector array, signal conditioning electronics, and then some form of digitizer as well as processing. So 
In this talk, I'm going to focus on three areas that we see integration already happening or coming in the near future, uh, one on the transmit side and two on the receive side. <clears throat> and those in particular on the transmit side are the laser plus the laser diode. Uh, the focus there will be increased performance. I'll talk a little bit more about that. On the receive side, we'll talk about integrating the photo detector with the amplification that connects to it and why you might want to do that, both uh, performance but also increasing the throughput through parallel uh, operation. And then finally, integration of the data conversion with processing. And here it's less performance focused and more focused on cost reduction and also reducing the heat, which is a, a big issue, particularly as you try to scale the size of LiDAR systems. OK, so let's start by talking about the laser diode plus its driver. And before we get into the specifics of the laser, I want to talk a little bit about the trend towards narrower pulses. There's, I think, multiple factors that motivate this trends to, towards narrower and narrower pulses, but the easiest one, in my opinion, to describe is eye safety, so that's the one I, I've uh, chosen to include here. This was covered a little bit yesterday. Uh, there is this international standard, 60825. Um, it actually constrains two things from an eye safety point of view, at least for pulse slider, uh, though many people tend not to talk about both. It constrains both the energy contained in a single pulse as well as the time average power that's transmitted, which is effectively the product of the energy in a pulse times the rate at which you're firing the laser. Now it turns out, uh, at least in most systems that I've uh, been able to look at, <clears throat> pulse energy is the critical parameter. Uh, again, it's the product, uh, or sorry, the power is the product of the pulse energy and the repetition rate. But in most cases that I've seen, the thermal load, the heat generated uh, by pulsing the laser very rapidly tends to dominate or limit the system performance before you actually reach the eye safety limit. So in that case, this average power limit uh, tends not to be such a big issue, and we need to focus mostly on the energy per pulse. Just to go through some numbers here, the allowable energy per pulse is about 200 nanojoules at 905 nanometers. For reference, that's about 40 watts of peak power for an ideal rectangular pulse. Now, you can engineer around this to some extent as you use larger laser sources. Uh, you can increase this by about a factor of three, and then as you start to distribute the sources over areas much larger uh, than <clears throat> the pupil of the eye, uh, you can get to even higher energies. But just to keep in mind, this is a, a reasonable frame of reference for where we're limited. Now, when you're limited to, say, something like this, narrower pulses are a good thing. Uh, they're a win because, for example, if you want to maintain the 200 nanojoules and you can shrink the pulse width, you're not going to increase your optical peak power. So you can see further. Now you might want not, excuse me, might not want to do that. Uh, maybe you can already see far enough. Uh, in that case, for the same thermal load, for the same heat generated, you can now increase your laser repetition rate, which means you probably are getting better spatial resolution or perhaps even better distance through averaging. And in both cases, you're likely improving your range resolution with a narrower pulse. There's necessarily less ambiguity in terms of time, which translates to distance. Okay, so we want narrow pulses and we want them to be higher. What does that mean for uh, generating this light? <clears throat> well, unfortunately, while we want both narrow and uh, large peak power, that's not the way laser diodes and laser driver circuits tend to work. Most designs limit the ratio of the peak power or the current to the pulse width. So you end up with curves like this, where on the x-axis you have pulse width, on the y-axis you have optical peak power, and for any given laser driver, you can sort of operate on this line. And that's not what we wanted. We said we wanted narrow pulses and, and high peak power. We want to be up here. So why is that? Uh, it turns out the culprit is inductance. Uh, for those of you who may have taken electrical courses some number of years ago in college, maybe you remember the characteristic equation for an inductor. It can be written this way. It tells you that the rate of change of current with respect to time is proportional to the ratio between the voltage across it and the inductance. Current uh, through a laser diode is proportional to optical peak power. So what this really says is to get a big optical peak power in a short time, we need this ratio to be big, or we need to minimize inductance. Now, inductance is not something we typically put in the circuits. It's just there as a parasitic. It's part of the packaging that we use. It's part of the board layout. And it's even intrinsic in the devices themselves, say the lasers or uh, some of the other passives. So optimizing the packaging, optimizing the board design is key to getting the maximum performance that we want out of these laser drivers. As an example, if we were to start here and have the inductance, we could either double the peak power, 
We could half the pulse width. We could do sort of anything in between. Or we could keep the performance the same in terms of uh, peak power and pulse width and significantly reduce the loss because uh, loss in these, uh, many of the loss terms in these circuits are proportional to voltage or perhaps even voltage squared. So with operating with a lower voltage actually significantly increases the efficiency even for the same laser and laser driver. Uh, just a little bit more details on why this exists. We have to think about the principle of operation of a laser diode uh, driver circuit. The laser diode's here. And the way this works is you store some energy in a capacitor. And when this switch turns on, the energy will discharge from the capacitor through the laser diode generating light. The problem is that's not the way the circuit really looks. And there are these parasitics. And this inductance, again, it's lumped here together as one element, but it's sort of distributed between this device, this device. And the routing between all of them is the problem. Uh, so you can see that here, your choice of laser, your choice of FET, the device down here, the transistor, uh, as well as the capacitor affect the inductance. The stack up of the board, how you do your layout affects it. And even using arrays of lasers, many systems use four, four lasers or 16 or perhaps even more. Uh, as you go to higher and higher channel count, the practical uh, routing limitations of getting between the individual laser, uh, say, cathodes and uh, uh, the switches or the capacitors, the practical aspects of that also uh, impact the inductance. And so we need to be very careful with that. To back that up, we did some measurements here. So this is some actual experimental data. The setup here is we chose an off-the-shelf laser diode, likely supplied by somebody in this room. We used discrete electronics sort of off-the-shelf and happened to use a 30-volt supply. And we measured this under two conditions. We basically first did our initial design. Uh, this is uh, the uh, actual measured pulse of uh, time on the x-axis here and optical peak power on the y-axis. This is our first design, the blue curve. And then we went back and looked at the layout. We used the same components. So we didn't switch the laser. We didn't increase the voltage. We didn't cheat in any way like that. We were just careful about what is the path that the discharge current takes, uh, as well as uh, selecting some of the passives, such as the capacitor, to minimize inductance. And by doing that, without changing anything else, we increased the performance by 35%. Okay, what does this actually mean? Well, this means that being uh, very careful, but also having sort of deep knowledge about how these things are connected, how you do the layout, is, is perhaps one of the most critical parts of getting the most performance out of your laser. Uh, and that's something that I don't think a, a large number of companies are equipped to do. So the next step, in my opinion, for the industry is smart partitioning of the packaging. We're going to need cooperation, for example, between driver companies and laser companies to come up with integrated solutions that don't place this burden, trying to get the green performance instead of the blue, or perhaps something even worse, on companies whose expertise doesn't really lie in that area. Of course, it's not as simple as just minimizing inductance. It also includes consider considerations for thermal dissipation. Lasers get very hot, and you have to conduct the heat out of the package. So the more things you put in there aren't necessarily better uh, from that point of view. And the impacts on the optics as well, thermal lensing and, and things that heat might do as you increase it. OK, so now to move on and talk about the photo detector. I'm going to talk about the amplifier a bit. I'll use the term TIA for any of you who aren't familiar. TIA stands for Transimpedance Amplifier. Most photo detect detectors, I've drawn an APD here, are current output devices. So a transimpedance is just something that takes a current and turns it into a voltage. And that's typically done with a resistance uh, placed across the terminals of an amplifier in order to efficiently draw the current out of the photo detector here and turn it into a voltage at its output. So what are the interesting or important parameters of a TIA for, the, uh, for its application in LiDAR? Uh, the first one is bandwidth. So we were just talking about NARA pulses and trying to generate those. Well, it turns out in the receive signal chain, you need to match the bandwidth of your uh, amplifier, actually the entire signal chain, to the pulse width in order to get those benefits. And you can run so through some math, but you find that roughly the bandwidth of your uh, receiver should be uh, greater than one over the pulse width. So as an example, for the five nanosecond pulses we were talking about, you need about 200 megahertz of bandwidth. How do you figure out what the bandwidth of a TIA is? Well, the easiest way is to go to an application note and find an equation like this. Uh, it's proportional to a few terms, something sort of intrinsic to the amplifier itself called gain bandwidth product, the resistance and feedback here, and then the total capacitance at the input, which is a combination of a bunch of things, but does include the capacitance of this photodiode. State-of-the-art transimpedance amplifiers have something on the order of a gigahertz of gain bandwidth product. Uh, 
So that means to achieve this 200 megahertz of bandwidth we were talking about, you can use something like a four kilo ohm resistor if you have one picofarad of total capacitance at the input. Now, if you want to go to narrower pulses and you want higher bandwidth, one of these two has to change. You, for example, can use a lower resistor, but that's not good because it increases noise. And so it's going to be critical to minimize this input capacitance in terms of uh, achieving the maximum bandwidth. To talk a little bit more about noise, I grabbed this diagram from a data sheet. It shows the noise spectral density, so the current noise at the input on the y-axis as a function of frequency on the x-axis. And it shows it for several different noise contributors. The red line here is the co um, combination of them all. But you can see that the feedback resistor, the one we typically think of, is this, uh, I guess, yellowish or orange one here. It's flat with frequency. But there's other noise terms you have to consider, uh, and especially consider when you get to uh, wide frequency or wide bandwidth systems because their noise density increases with increasing frequency. And one of the particular ones of interest or of importance, if you will, is this thing that's labeled EN. That's the voltage noise input referred of the amplifier. And the reason that's relevant is to turn a voltage noise into a current. Remember the APDs or the, the, the photodiodes, uh, silicon photomultipliers, whatever you use, they're current output devices. So we want to refer all of our noises to a current. You do that by multiplying by the input capacitance. So if you have a larger input capacitance, this entire green curve or blue curve, uh, I guess it's blue, uh, shifts up vertically. And that makes the noise worse. And it's actually a double whammy because not only does uh, EN <clears throat> increase with input capacitance, but it also depends on frequency. So as we want to go to wider bandwidth, EN's doubly uh, painful. You're integrating more of this noise that's out here, and it becomes even more dependent on your input capacitance. <clears throat> So again, this is motivation for why minimizing the input capacitance is critical. This is part of photodiode design, right? We want the photodiodes themselves to have very deep junctions that are fully depleted, to have as small capacitance as possible. But it's also a function of packaging and layout, just as it was with the laser drivers. And this is going to lead us to integration. Now, something I haven't talked about too much is uh, the arraying up of detectors. Um, but I think that is clearly a trend, just as we talked about four-channel or 16-channel lasers. It's very common to see 16-channel, 32, or even higher-channel uh, detector arrays eventually limit, I think, uh, well, for one, uh, export considerations. But in either case, uh, we're moving to detector arrays, and that means we're moving to TIA arrays as well. Of course, as I mentioned, the detectors need to be optimized for low capacitance, but beyond that, we have to think about the packaging. So what I've shown here, shown here is a... <clears throat> A package, the right side is sort of a cutout of it where you can see a photodetector array on top of a TIA array. This happens to be a backside illuminated photodetector, so it's flipped over, illuminated through the back, and it's directly bumped to the TIA array. That, that minimizes capacitance, that minimizes the parasitic between those two connections, uh, or those two components rather, and <coughs> optimizes performance. Now, if you do this, you have to think about low power design because you don't want to heat up photodetectors or the dark current increases. So low power design becomes even more critical. The last thing I want to point out is the people in the world who make the best TIAs are not the same as the people in the world who make the best photodetectors. And so getting the best performance out of a package like this, just as it was with lasers, is going to rely on collaboration or partnerships around our industry. And again, this is another instance, but I'll talk about it more a little bit later. So the last topic to cover is A to D conversion, as well as its integration with processing. Uh, I want to look at the return waveform. So as a function of time, what signal is coming into my LiDAR receiver? And I've just sort of drawn it as this noisy waveform here. And now we have to decide if something was there. This uh, direct time of flight was covered a little bit yesterday in the Phantom Intelligence talk. But just as a recap, in case you weren't there, Effectively, what you do is you set some threshold and you wait until the signal crosses over that threshold. And when that happens, at that event, you decide or, or uh, measure what the time and therefore what the distance of the object was of that crossing. Now, as you can see here, while it may be a simple power and cost efficient solution because TDCs themselves are uh, relatively small <clears throat> and uh, I should say not, not particularly complex, uh, as well as the sort of detection scheme itself being not particularly complex, the SNR requirement is going to be higher. You need this threshold to be relatively high so that any noise that's down here doesn't actually uh, accidentally rather, rather trigger against your threshold. So that means systems built with this uh, direct time of flight 
approach are, in my opinion, necessarily going to be limited to shorter range than they could otherwise be. So what's the alternative? We can go to full waveform digitization. We can take what we had up here, digitize it with an ADC. We generate many more samples. Uh, but now that we have all of these samples, we have the ability to do certain things such as filtering. And that reduces noise. So I've drawn a much smoother waveform here. This would be after filtering as compared to here or there. Uh, and that maximizes your SNR, particularly in the case that you know the waveform you transmitted. You can do a matched filter, which can be shown to theoretically optimize SNR. And so these systems are going to be longer range systems. If range is your problem, I think you're going to do better with full waveform digitization than you are with direct time of flight. But it doesn't come without penalty. There is uh, overhead associated with generating all of this data, both in terms of the power, but also moving this data around. There's a lot more data over here. There's one data point here. When did it cross? Here there's, I don't know what I've drawn, maybe 100 samples, something like that, and amplitude values associated with each of them. Uh, going back to a signal chain, this is a little bit redrawn from what I had earlier, but a similar thing where you have TIAs connected to ADCs. And now I've explicitly called out the high-speed serial link between the ADC and the back-end processor, in this case an FPGA, which I think is, at least for prototyping purposes, the most common, commonly used processor. Uh, and let's look a little bit more detail as to those penalties. So with the high-speed ADC, they're not cheap. Uh, for something that's running at a giga sample per second or so, you're looking at probably $100 per channel in what I would consider reasonably low volumes, uh, 1,000 units. Uh, they also consume power, half a watt. So if you have a large array of these, you're, you're spending hundreds of dollars as well as several watts of power. What about this link, this high-speed serial link? One example would be jsd 204 b That's a standard uh, CERTES high-speed serial link. Uh, and the thing I want to call out here, uh, there's actually two things. One is that there's a lot of power associated with it. So again, you're spending a watt just to move information from here to there. You're not doing anything with that. You're just sending it from point A to point B. Uh, and incurring a penalty. But perhaps more significantly, it limits the choices of FPGA. FPGAs that can accept this high-speed serial link uh, are not um, as cheap as perhaps ones that use lower, lower bandwidth links, and particularly when you need automotive qualified FPGAs. So if you actually look at what those FPGAs are, you probably are looking at more than $1,000. So there's a lot of cost here, yeah, several hundred dollars here, several thousand dollars there. From just two components uh, in your LiDAR system, you haven't even really built the rest of the LiDAR system, but you've already completely blown your budget, uh, at least for the low-cost low ADAS stuff, uh, over and over again. And it's effectively limited by this high-speed serial link. So what can we do? Well, let's go back to the ADC data waveform uh, that we had before. Again, it's high speed, but the thing to recognize here is that most of this is not an echo. If I were to take a rangefinder and shoot the back of the room, I'm probably only going to hit one thing, that wall back there. Everything else is just space. There's no real uh, data of interest coming back to me. So wouldn't it be great if I could just recognize these two areas that I previously uh, knew, because I happened to draw this waveform, uh, that were uh, returns. If I could identify those and send only that information, it would really help me out. And that's the concept here. Let's identify data of interest. Uh, through some mechanism. Let's identify where these two returns are and transmit only this data and ignore the rest of it. And what does that actually mean from a throughput point of view? It's actually, uh, though it's a simple concept, very effective. So I ran through an example here where, uh, just to keep the numbers round, I said, what if my LiDAR needs to see 300 meters? That's two microseconds of digitized data. Again, using the example of five nanosecond pulses that I've been using. I'll allow for eight possible echoes. I think eight is probably more than you need, but let's allow for some false alarms. That means you only need to transmit 40 nanoseconds out of the full two microseconds of data. That's a 50x data reduction. 98% okay? of the data that my ADC converted, I don't actually want to see. So if I can get rid of that, that really could have a uh, significant benefit. Since I've talked a little bit, uh, a few times about automotive qualification, I, I want to bring that up here. It's come up a few times in different talks and mostly in the context of temperature. And it is true that temperature is important. Uh, whether that be 85C, for example, for your LiDAR, typically translates to 125C or even higher for the components that analog devices or, or like companies would supply. Uh, that's only part of the story, and it's actually a small part of the story, even though it's the part of the story I hear people talk about the most. Automotive qualification really is a lot more than temperature range. Uh, I've listed some things here, 
APQP is essentially a set of processes that we follow to uh, increase the likelihood that we can meet the automotive standards. Um, but I've listed some more of the AEC, Automotive Electronics Council, uh, qualification requirements up here that are beyond temperature. So we have to think about things like all of the other stress tests, high humidity as well as high temperature, making these things reliable and last for 10 years in the field, 10,000 hours of lifetime, and to do so with a very low uh, failure rate. The components we sell that are automotive qualified have a target failure rate of less than one part per million. Uh, and I would, I would ask uh, the LiDAR developers here if they truly believe that the systems they're building today, they could build a million of them, put them in the field for 10 years, and get less than one return on average. Uh, it's really quite a challenge. And that's before we even start to talk about functional safety. Functional safety is built on top of all of this. You have to have done a good job, follow the automotive uh, development practices, and then you layer on top of that safety elements. Uh, I won't really get into this. That could be its own talk. Uh, but I think it is uh, a significant challenge that's going to face all of us and currently being significantly underestimated in terms of how much pain it's going to cause a lot of the, uh, the, the ecosystem in the coming years, in just my opinion. OK, speaking of the ecosystem, this is the last thing I'd like to talk about. <clears throat> Uh, I'll first talk about how I see all of the, the sort of different players interacting today and then how I think that's going to change in the coming years. Uh, I'll first state that while I put some logos up here, this is by no means an exhaustive list. Please don't be offended if your name's not up here. I just uh, picked the first few that, that popped to mind or, or were easy, easy to find the logos of. Uh, so we have users up here, effectively tier ones and OEMs and, and disruptors, and then sensor developers. And today, I think generally the specifications flow from users down to developers who respond to those, <clears throat> of course. And then below that, we have uh, where my company sits, broad market component vendors. We have relatively standard or general purpose components that we supply into the sensor developers. And then I've separated out here specialized component vendors who have, uh, in many cases, unique technology. Uh, often specific to a particular type of system, whether that be FMCW or, or some particular aspect of scanning or processing or whatever. But in, in this case, they're, they're uh, application specific. So I think this is uh, reasonably well established and we're all pretty comfortable with this. In the future, what's going to change? So the first thing I've done is I've separated out the vehicle developers from what I'm calling the industrial design of the LiDAR. Uh, and I've done this because I'm, as you'll see in a second, I'm not going to have an arrow between these two. And why is that? Well, we talked about automotive qualification. I think we're already starting to see it, but I think it's going to be very commonplace or become commonplace that the vehicle developers up here are going to demand, uh, basically accept, accept no substitute for the experience these guys have in industrializing designs for automotive. All right? So we're not going to have direct interact. I mean, Sensor developers will continue, of course, to talk to vehicle developers, but we won't have sourcing of sensors uh, directly through this. Uh, and in that case, the sensor developers effectively become technology development arms of tier ones. And you're already starting to see this happen with a lot of partnerships announced. Uh, I think that will continue, perhaps even some acquisitions. I've then merged all the component developers into uh, one big box at the bottom. And the reason I did this is I think the components that are sourced to the sensor developers will become much more application specific. We won't have as many general purpose components flowing into these applications. We'll have designs developed uniquely for them. Uh, of course, more partnerships. I, I uh, brought up several examples of that uh, sort of within this community. You know, company A talking to B, talking to C uh, to come up with these, these innovative solutions. I also think many of those solutions will flow up directly to vehicle developers. We're already seeing that where these guys reach down to the bottom to find uh, technology that they find compelling and then direct buys or direct design ins to the tier ones and the sensor developers. Uh, and the last thing is you'll notice I don't have the small component technology uh, companies listed here anymore. Uh, I didn't want to call anybody out in particular, uh, but I do believe that in large part they're going to go away that will in um, some cases be uh, extinction, if you will. Uh, in other cases, it will be absorption uh, through mergers and acquisitions. <clears throat> but in large part, I think this base is going to consolidate uh, as well as some other consolidation elsewhere. <clears throat> 
Okay, so to wrap up, we talked about performance being needed. We went over integration, the three areas that I think are going to integrate in order to drive performance. Uh, we talked about the industry evolving to no longer have just this sort of linear relationship from top to bottom, but a much more interconnected web between uh, the vehicle developers, the sensor developers, and the component suppliers. And of course, no single company can do it alone. So I'm looking forward to, our company's looking forward to being part of this and, and hopefully uh, with the help of all of you. Thank you.